you for having me here today. Um, I feel very privileged to be able to talk to you twice today. So in about an hour's time, I'm going to talk to you um, alongside my colleague Sarah Drake about saliva assessment and management. But for right, right now, I'm going to talk to you about something that's very different um, and that when I looked into it, there's, it's not really been done before in the MND literature. Um, and it's quite timely after morning tea because it's something that you all did so very effortlessly and so very naturally um, and it's something that just by the mere words that you say reflects who you are and what you actually stand for. And this morning we've been fortunate to hear from great speakers about topics that mentioned the words discussion, uh, conversation, um, and lots of interesting things about decision making. Um, and how do we do that when we can't tap into somebody's lexicon to hear the words they want to say and the way they want to say them? So um, we are going to talk about something that falls under the umbrella term of communication, and that is this big fancy word, which is conversation. Um, there's no picture with this slide on purpose because I really want to draw your attention to the word conversation. And if there's one thing from this talk that you take home today and take back to your clinical practice, it is this word. Because conversation is defined in the literature, in the MND literature, as the very essence of human life, yet it's something that actually isn't mentioned in the literature at all. So we mention communication, we mention interaction, but nobody in the MND literature talks about this word, conversation. They all talk about conversation in disability literature, and they talk about conversation in aphasia and apraxia of speech. But why is it not mentioned when we talk about things that pertain to dysarthria, which is a motor speech impairment. Um, conversation um, is something that I feel is a bit of a lost soul in MND. Um, and this talk is really aimed at people who present with severe dysarthria or anarthria, where they're no longer able to conversate by writing, speaking, or typing means. So just remember that when I'm talking about these, the, our people with MND, I'm referring to people who have severe dysarthria and anarthria in the absence of the ability to type or write and obviously speak. Um, something that I always say to my patients with MND is, I want to hear your voice. Keep talking to me. Keep using your voice. It seems to be um, a little bit of a, uh, um, catch-22 when somebody's speaking becomes so dysarthric that we think, oh, no, 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 you need to use this now. Um, so alongside my colleague um, Sarah Drake, Natalie James and um, Fiona Barry, we run a communication assistive technology, but it's not initially about replacing somebody's speech. And I think that every time we see a patient, what I try to do is really detach the dysarthria from their underlying voice and focus on the words they're saying and how they say them. So you'll see that one of the take homes for future directions at the end of this talk is really about trying to um, break down how the person communicates or has a conversation so that you can use that and harness that later on. So what I'm presenting to you today is not something that's in the literature. It's not evidence-based practice yet. So that seems a little bit taboo and a little bit wrong, um, fraudulent, I guess. It feels good when we're doing evidence-based practice. It feels clean and tidy. But what I'm presenting to you today is really the findings that I saw in my own clinic room, that I thought, aren't I fabulous? Here's my beautiful communication board. It's colorful, it's got pictures. I think it really encapsulates the patient's interests. But then when we put a podcast in front of a patient and said, right, here's a shared topic, or here's a movie trailer, let's use your AAC system, whether it's low tech or high tech, that we've, we've created to have a conversation, it was awful. And I felt useless and I had no answers for my patient to be able to bridge the gap back to this word here. And so that irked me, it didn't sit well with me and I had to go on a, a bit of a quest to find out how we bridge the gap back to conversation. So that's what I'm going to show you. I'm gonna show you my little bridge um, full of easy um, stress and strain in terms of civil engineering language. Um, it's not a pretty one. 
it's not fancy yet and there's a long way to go and it only goes maybe a quarter of the way. So there's a lot of research to be done to look at this very thing. So remembering that we're looking at severe dysarthria and arthria in the absence of being able to, re, uh, to type or write. Um, but also what I'll show you today, you can apply to low tech and high tech. And I hope that it resonates with you so that you can take it back to your clinical workplace tomorrow and give it a go. People with um, MND have so much to say, and we, t we heard before about timing of things. I have a little poster in my office, it's a patient education board, and the poster says, there's no right time to say it. There's no right time for any of us to say anything. It's like having kids, right? There's no right time to have kids. You just do it. So I think that um, when it comes to saying things, it's not Hollywood. We can't wait till we're on our deathbed to say these things. So I encourage my patients to write it down or say it now. Say it and then write it down for later. So this is what we're going to have a look at today. Um, let's look at this one. So. Um, and another um, problem, I had a bit of a conundrum. This is what we're going to cover, sorry. Um, communication, conversation, intelligibility versus interaction, bridging the gap with AAC and suggestions for clinical practice. Um, so this also stems from some clients that I've had who are illiterate. Um, and culturally and linguistically diverse as well, where finding an app um, or uh, using simple-to-speech app was just not meeting their needs, so I needed something else. So I thought we'd just go back to the basics and look at the good old-fashioned dictionary. Um, so communication is, um, by definition, imparting or the exchange of information by speaking, writing, or via some other medium. So what that shows is that we actually are encouraged to be multimodal communicators. That's fantastic. So that seeing that society recognizes that but the problem is um, and where the stigma comes in that our patients are experiencing is that the ratio to speaking is much higher and the ratio that, than the ratio of using multimodal modalities okay so we can show people text messages we can show people pictures we've got a Facebook social media that type of thing that's all multimodal um, so what we need to do is kind of equalize that ratio or replace that ratio so that it seems more socially acceptable to our clients. And I guess for people in the room who are speech pathologists, have you gone to the local cafe on your weekend using an AAC system? Do you know what it feels like to use an AAC system? It feels incredibly foreign. It's very alien. It doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel normal. And so this is, I guess, also um, a school of thought about why people are slow to um, take on AAC and what their retention um, is like. Um, so if we look at the ICF framework, we are focusing on participation. I think when our patients come to us, there's lots of bodies of literature and in ALS MND that talk about um, it's more from a rehab point of view, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but that comes at a restorative point of view, not habilitation, which is about compensating. And so we have urgency to fix, and that's just not going to work. And I think that that's why we run into some roadblocks along the way with conversation stuff. Um, so for our people with MND, communication really becomes this. When they have severe dysarthria, anarthria in the absence of typing and writing, they're limited to single word utterances, maybe one to three if they're lucky, yes, no responses all the time. And don't get me wrong, some of these things are good and we need these things, but remember we're multimodal communicators. We should have a bag of tricks that we pull out in certain situations that um, show who we are, what we stand for, like I said at the beginning. It's partner dependent, puts a lot of stress on the carer, a lot of burden to guess, oh, they really mean this. Um, you know, or the carer feels like maybe they didn't want baked beans, they wanted this, the tin of spaghetti, who knows? Um, and so they feel stressed about that. Are they really meeting their needs? Was that the right answer that they, they thought I wanted to give to the doctor? Um, they have limited lexicons when they really actually have a very vast one. We just haven't tapped into it. Um, and they have limited access um, to how to utilize some of their systems and, and access their lexicons too. 
and the topics seem to be all negative stuff, okay? And that's just not okay. Um, people that I work with in my team, I am described as the optimist, maybe too much so. Um, I'm the little bubbly one that runs down the corridor <laughs> and I'm quite happy with that because I would like to think that everybody who's sitting in the chairs today, 160 of you, would give it a go, that would try if you're standing on the other side of the bed rail to someone, that you would try. So I try weird and wonderful things, quirky things. I'm going to show you some weird, quirky things very soon that's going to challenge your preconceived notions of what AAC actually is and to steer away from these this MND diagnosis that's always in their face. It's just not okay. It leads to feelings of depression, anxiety, panic. Um, they are so much more than their diagnosis. It's like taking the dysarthria away for just one second, take the diagnosis away. What's under that? Who were you before? And what have you got left to give? And what's your legacy going to be at the end? And I need to know it now. Um, because it's going to help your wife cope and your family cope and you'll always live on. So we're really talking about lots of meaty things that puts a lot of pressure on the speechy, I might say. A conversation is simply this, by definition of the dictionary, a talk, especially an informal one between two or more people in which news and ideas are expressed. I can stand here and tell you that 100% of my patients can 100% proficiently communicate their needs and some feelings, but I cannot stand here and confidently say that they can communicate novel thoughts and express their opinions um, and that, or maybe they've had a change of heart when it comes to advanced care planning and that type of thing. So it really involves everybody in the room understanding that first and foremost, this is a person that needs to be heard. Conversation, we don't want to go there because it's completely fraught with disaster. Th there's going to be communication breakdown, it's inevitable. And you're going to have to be the specialist, the professional that tries to fix it. And um, that's okay. And I think it's about having the conversation, the conversation with the patient to say, sometimes I might not understand where we're going with this and um, it's about using written supplementation it's really old school in speech therapy okay it's where we say total communication all right I'm writing something down do you want to talk about this this or is it something else oh it's something else right let's think about that can you give me some clues and using the whole context to draw it in it's hard work but it's so worth it and I think that when we see people at the end stage of life if we haven't gone there with them we know nothing about them and we know not we can't advocate on their behalf that they might want to listen to the sound of music while they're lying there you know when the, the room is really dark maybe that makes them feel really anxious and they really prefer the lights on. Um, so conversations are really how we interact with the world so it makes sense to me that we go there. Okay very quickly by contrast you can see that there's so much more to conversation. 60% of conversation in the literature is what actually interests us. I don't want to talk about the diagnosis. I want to talk about stuff that interests me. So we really need to hear people gossip. I want to hear their opinions. I want them to vent. I want them to talk for comfort. You know, we're all on our phones these days and I say to my husband, excuse me, I'm right here. Get off your phone. I want to talk to you. I want you to listen to me. Um, telling jokes, offering advice, saying something silly. People have so much to offer. Um, we are treating depression and anxiety. Um, a lot with pharmacological means and we just can't get people to converse about how they're feeling. One of the first things I say to people when they walk in and they're diagnosed is you will keep talking about how you feel. Now we have to also remember that our people with MND are not infants, they're not emergent um, language users. So sometimes it's not okay to be giving single words. Now this is where an interesting um, stat comes from Bethany Diner. She says that 70% of our language, 70% of what you guys did at morning tea was formulaic, a big fancy word for chunks. We have pre-stored chunks of language that we draw out on particular situations um, 
for efficiency's sake, you know, and 30% is just what we extract from our lexicon. So um, what we need to do and what my um, little area of research will be in is looking at how systematically we access the language system and use that um, to help people get back to conversations. And as I mentioned before, we need to um, provide compensation, compensatory measures um, rather than trying to restore things. And a lot of the literature for MND has been focusing on intelligibility um, and, and voice. Um, but um, I'll show you this now um, very quickly. This is my... Um, can I keep going? Is that all right? Um, this is the speechy in me. I just keep talking. Um, very quickly, my data was showing funny things. Um, we want people to have successful interactions. Block has spent his life's work in MND, and I had um, the. Um, I was able to go and, and hear him speak and he says that just give people a newspaper, watch the interaction, and comment on the things they're doing well. It's, it's good, I love how it's positive, it's really optimistic, and he thought that by giving positive feedback improved the interaction. Here's some things we talked about before. And then what um, I heard, and it came down on me like a ton of bricks, was the word script when I went to a technology workshop. And then I started to think, hang on a minute, speech pathology is a pretty young profession, it's only 30 years or so old, and what we actually need to do, what we've all learnt from adults, is that comes from paediatrics. And so maybe I just need to borrow something from aphasia and apraxia of speech. Um, and so this is what I came up with. A question and statement board was my first thing. So remember that I said some of my patients were illiterate. I put some pictures next to that. Um, and um, we went through this question and statement board. And they talk about things that are related to MND, things like, promise me you won't put me in a nursing home. Promise me. And the speech pathologist, me, um, said this with inflection to show this is how you would point. And I must say, you can use these ideas with different um, access methods. Um, so, but for right now, it was about pointing, so direct access. There are things like, oh my god, that is crazy. Um, oh, that's interesting. Um, things like that, that they can participate, they can ad lib in the conversation. Um, did you remember this one? Remember, this is a lady's um, question statement board. She had so much to say uh, that I had to create a book, like a binded book. And so we categorized her what questions and, and things like that. And so remember that, do you remember? Remember to lock the door because she was in charge of that. So it allows autonomy and sense of control. Um, everyday things, which you can see there. Um, and then that's, this is the next idea. And this is brand new. It doesn't exist in the literature. And um, I'm not sure why I haven't thought of this before. But it's from Humans et al, who talks about script training. But this time, we're using scripts as low-tech AAC without the rote learning. So they do this in disability um, and aphasia and apraxia of speech, but not um, in ALS. It's not, it's not been written up. Um, so here is an example of a script of um, a patient that I worked with. I said, what are you interested? At first I said, what type of communicator are you? Are you a man of few words or you're a storyteller? And he said, I'm a man of few words. Okay, what are your topics? What do you usually talk about? Before MND, what would you usually talk about? And he identified oh, six topics that he would usually talk about. Things like social greetings, um, his boat. So you've got here, my son has a boat. It's a 16-foot fishing boat. You can see here that you could put your lines in, but they will change because conversation should be spontaneous. Um, but the idea of this is that we can maximize the amount of participation this person's having, um, and he can be assertive rather than passive. Um, and he can offer some more novel and specific things. Now, this is also still limited. Remember I said I can't build the bridge the whole way yet. I think there's some room for artificial intelligence intelligence, maybe some more brain interface technologies, that kind of thing to help predict what people want to say. But what this shows is that I would never have known this information before had I not engaged this person in a conversation about his interests and that there's so much more to a person than just their diagnosis. Um, the line seven there leads on to, yeah, I eat it, I catch it, my wife cooks it, she's a good cook. So then the human instinct in us would be, oh, 
oh right, so what does she cook and how does she cook that? And what's your favourite meal? Those types of things. These are really important for later on. Here's another one. It's not about doom and gloom. It's about everyday life. It's about stuff that you and I do. This lady, she likes selling houses and escape to the country. She said, let's sit down and watch TV. She's concerned her husband's burnt out. He just needs to sit down. He keeps traipsing up and down. Selling houses or escape to the country? She'd point to this, she can say it even. Um, some people with severe dysarthria have a lot of trouble getting started. Um, and so this can actually help them get started and have support, and support when they're speaking. They should have taken that offer, idiots. The person's not a bad person, she's lovely. But she needs to express emotion. People are emotive beings. And then she can select what number and so on and so forth. Now, within the confines of AAC, all AAC should be accurate. It should be spot on, it should be efficient, it should be quick, and it shouldn't be fatiguing. So these are the three main parameters that when we're looking at AAC for somebody, they should meet these requirements. Quick and snappy, just like you talked at morning tea. So the goal really is for our patients to be multimodal conversationists, conversationalists. We need to think beyond intelligibility. We need to measure the success of the interactions and analyze what made it successful um, and we need to really monitor how they how they converse what do they do um, what kind of words are they saying um, things like I love that expression let's write it down we might need to use it one day um, and empower people's families um, to really go oh that was, that was a great interaction we just had, or I know these are the things you stereotypically say, let's write them down. Um, and keep having conversations, get to know your patient's interests, and then taking pre and post videos. So be the optimist and give it a go. Um, that's that. <laughs>